sure that if your lives are anything like mine, working in tech, living in Silicon Valley, you hear about the Internet of Things, or as some people prefer to call it, the programmable world, every day. And a question that we'd like to explore over the next hour is just what exactly, for example, do big data analytics mean to the supply side of energy? What do uh, cloud-based services mean to energy supply and demand? And uh, in particular, how will products and services related to the intersection of the Internet of Things and energy show up all around us? And, and uh, what sort of em interesting and emergent economic models uh, can we expect at that intersection? So I'm Dave Blakely. I'm the Director of Technology Strategy at IDEA, which is an innovation consultancy headquartered here in Palo Alto. And I'd ask, like to ask each member of the panel to do two things. First of all, to introduce themselves and to talk about what each of you is working on today. And number two, to tell us what in the hell the Internet of Things means to you. I guarantee you we'll get three very different answers. Reza. Want to go first? Sure. I'm happy to do that. Hi, uh, my name is Reza Raji. I, uh, I've been in Silicon Valley for about 25 years. Uh, kind of going from one startup to another. The last one I did, and I've been lucky enough to be involved with IRD for about 20 or so years. It's actually that old. I know you've been hearing about it a lot lately, but it's been, it's been around for a while. Uh, the last company I started uh, was called iControl, uh, uh, which is, you know if you don't really know, but it's the company behind uh, almost all the, not all, but almost all the interactive home security and home automation offerings from Comcast, AT, Time Warner, Fox, Rogers, and so forth. Everybody calls it something different. AT calls it Pulse, uh, Comcast calls it Xfinity Home, but it's really the platform uh, behind that. It's really the first true mass market that's one of the IoT for the consumer. Uh, we kind of mass marketized home automation and home control and home security uh, in, a, in a unique way. And uh, uh, right now, I, I founded that company, I was a CEO and chairman for a while. I, and I uh, left about two years ago to do a whole bunch of other things in a startup in the IoT world, so I'm advising a bunch of IoT companies, amongst other things. Um, what does uh, IoT mean? I think, so historically, IoT um, started out as being sort of a network of devices. You know, you have a desktop, or you have a building, or a factory, and you have these collections of devices and sensors that connect to each other, just like people do with the internet, but it's sort of an enclosed uh, island of communication, uh, so that was the original uh, kind of the definition of IoT before it was even called IoT. It was called <laughs> networking and sensor networks and so forth. The, the next thing that got added to the whole IoT uh, term was connecting those devices to the internet so they could be remotely controlled and monitored. Uh, and you know, I was lucky enough to be involved with the early formations of Genesis, all that movement, and that parlayed into sort of. You know, I control. That's how the business plan for I control came about back in the late '90s. Uh, and then the other, the other, the third leg of the IoT stool. Uh, I'm sure, there's more legs you guys will come up with. But the other one is called end to end. You know, people refer to as end to end, uh, which is machine to machine. It's, it's uh, devices talking to each other instead of people talking to each other through email and web browsers. Uh, but those, you know, there's a lot of confusion. Was, we were we had a <coughs> conversation preparing for this panel before. And, you know, we all thought there's a ton of confusion about what the heck IoT is. Uh, there's a lot of, I can tell you it's not more easily than what it is, right? <laughs> almost. But uh, it's, it's got a lot of press lately because of the Nest acquisition and because of uh, a lot of uh, products and companies that have come about that allow you to control one device through an app. Uh, so it's gotten, it's gotten sexy because of that. But there's a lot more to it, right? There's a, there's a commercial industrial aspect of it, with street lighting and uh, pipeline, pipeline uh, uh, maintenance for oil and gas, and on and on and on, uh, which you could argue that there's a lot more value and dollars and business justifications around than controlling you know, a device in your home or your iPhone, which is really cool. Uh, but that's sort of, uh, that's sort of my, my definition in my mind about my that helps. Thank you. So Nate, let's let's hear from you. Yeah, sure. Well, let's not hear about Nest because hearing about Nest is going to bring out the petty, jealous side of the design, right? <laughs> no one wants to see that. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm Nate Williams. I've been at the intersection of technology and consumers for 15 years. Started my career at Walt Disney, 
re relative to home automation, I was actually part of the team at Intel that did a due diligence on Res's company I control. Ultimately, ultimately made the investment, started that running. Uh, I ran a company called Four Home that was backed by Verizon Ventures and others. We rolled out Verizon service. Subsequently, that was bought by Motorola and Google in 2010. So I was a senior director of uh, product marketing at Google, um, and then left last year. I now run a company called Greenleaf Systems. Uh, we're growth stage, 200 people, profitable. We work with Verizon, DirecTV, Eon Energy, Home Depot, etc. So we have a pretty large company. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about IoT. So specific to Internet of Things, the most basic level is the digital representation of a physical device. So if we look just at numbers, 0.6% of physical devices have a digital representation. So more than 99% of the devices that are out here in our physical world don't have any connectivity. And so the process of Internet of Things is really just about making those devices, whether it's a smart meter, whether it's a toothbrush, et cetera, connected. There's a lot of discussion about Internet of Things. And one of the reasons why you hear these names, whether it's Cisco, whether it's GE or IBM, is when we look at the secular shifts, so the first web, 1.0, then we look at mobile, then we look at SaaS, there are these trends that go through industry verticals. Internet of Things, as Reza pointed out, will fundamentally reshape many industries. And it could be fashion, it's happening here in the utility industry. We're actually having some discussions on the entertainment side. How can you make that entertainment experience more interactive? So when you think about it, whether it's Internet of Things, or it's connected devices, or it's M to M, those are just, that's just nomenclature, right? Tony Fidelli brought up Nest at, at the code conference. Tony was oh, like, please. Tony was like, I hate Internet of Things. We're going to call it whatever we call it. The truth is, there's two things we have to do as an industry. First is we have to extract value for the consumers. We have to actually have a value proposition that says, having this thing connected is better than not. If we can't do that, we shouldn't have a job. Second is, to the enterprise, we have to show based on Metcalf's laws, so we add more devices, more nodes to the network. We have to exponentially increase the value of that network. And so the opportunities that we focus on, myself as an entrepreneur and others here, is, is really how do we articulate that value to consumers, get them excited about a, a type of opportunity. Home automation has never been that exciting to folks outside of here in the sort of 280, right, 101 corridor. And then the next point is expose ways that organizations can save money, be more efficient, and actually provide a better layer of service. So looking forward to the discussion. Well, that's what I got. My name is Aaron McDaniel. I work in business development strategy for at and And I've been, in, in that role, I'm able to work with the Silicon Valley ecosystem of startups, venture capital firms to look for the latest technology that we can implement. Uh, but additionally, with special projects uh, focused on uh, things around the energy vertical, and in particular for us, taking a model that we've had with Royal Dutch Shell, where we're focused on getting connectivity basically anywhere across the world from terrestrial, mobile, satellite, uh, as well as adding value on top of that. And uh, to us, I think the Internet of Things is, is really an opportunity for us to matter. I mean, if you look at it, networks like AT&T are what are delivering this service. Without that, it doesn't really happen. But the exciting piece of it, with the onset of mobile, is that instead of what Reza had mentioned, things being constrained to a building, it's on global scale. So we're looking at being able to offer something across the globe, and ultimately what we want to do is provide that value to developers, to decision makers, and, and, and to customers to be able to reinvent processes and more quickly have insights to be able to, to pivot and make decisions. Thank you, so, Reza, I'd like to start with you for a quick with a question. You know, is it about Nest? Um, yeah. <laughs> we've, we've discussed that. <laughs> so, I think every, I think it's safe to say everybody in the room has seen um, rosy future scenarios, both on the supply side and the demand side of energy around the Internet of Things. We've all seen exciting scenarios around consumer uh, side Internet of Things, customer facing applications, particularly those involving convenience. Um, you know, energy saving, better, better understanding of energy, and so on. Um, it's hard to know which ring true, which we can really believe, how we're going to change people's behavior. We've also seen uh, 
supply side uh, scenarios, which are immense in terms of their op op operation. They often seem pretty abstract unless you really work in the field. What should we be paying attention to here? In, in both the near term and the longer term, what's important, both on the supply side and the demand side, looking at, at IoT and, and, and energy? Um, so I think uh, that's, a, that's a big question. Uh, so, so I think there, there is a couple of inflection points that have happened in the last five years, I would say, that make a big difference, right? So one is the fact that the cost of sensors and wireless in particular have really, really dropped, right? And it's not just standardization and protocol, but it's also the sheer cost and uh, the, the volume that you can make these things that have dropped. You can get a motion sensor for a lot less or, or a thermostat uh, built for a lot less money. Now, the other one is, uh, which I think is a good bigger shift, is uh, the prevalence of mobile smartphones in particular. So all of us here, most of us, have smartphones in our pocket. We know what it does, everything is app based. We have a certain expectation as consumers now about whipping out the phone and doing something useful with it, right? And, and there's a shift about going from complex apps now to single purpose apps, but that's a different discussion. So that, that is a monumental inflection point, I think, uh, which affects almost every industry, not just IoT, but we're talking about IoT, so it really affects that quite a bit at the enterprise level and as well as the, as well as the, uh, the consumer level. Um, so uh, I think, I think as I said earlier, I think the consumer stuff is neat, it's cool, Fitbits and jawbone up bands and all that stuff has gotten a lot of press. Um, but as I said, uh, I think the, even, even at the consumer level, like all the stuff that's being uh, pushed out as services from major telcos and cable companies and service providers have the Trojan horse of security. I mean, this is kind of one of the things we did at iControl, is like, look, energy management Fundamentally, uh, maybe some, let's say something controversial, but we don't want to offend anybody. The consumers in this country don't really care about energy management. They don't want to walk into Best Buy and say, yeah, I'll buy that $400 device to save 5% on my energy bill. That's not happening, and it hasn't happened. It's been a lot of proof points to point to that. I'm just making that up. There's been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, roadkill <laughs> over the last 10 years to prove that. Uh, it's it's a bigger deal in Europe because energy is a lot more expensive. You know, gallon gas is four times as more than it is now here. Uh, so until that happens here, people, consumers aren't going to care as much about that. So one of the things we did in eye control is we said, all right, the Trojan horse price is secured. Why? Because security is a $10 billion industry. Everybody in the street knows what it is. It's been around for 40 years. It's a $10 billion of services that, that's going out. We use that to get our foot in the door and really simplify that and make it beautiful and elegant and have an iPhone app and all that stuff with it. And then we can layer other things on top of it. So I think one of the things to address your question more directly is that you're going to see other things that are perhaps not able to stand on their own normally be now offered because there are layers on top of an existing platform that's been deployed at. Right? So major telcos, AT&T, Comcast, uh, are deploying this stuff, you know, there's other things you can lay on top of it, like energy management, right? So, yes, it's neat to be able to have a fancy smart talking thermostat or whatever that you can control remotely on your iPhone, but most people don't want to pay for that. It's a nice conversation piece. It's, you know, you can sell, I would say, you can sell hundreds of thousands of anything or tens of thousands of anything, but really to make it mass market so it can be applied to almost every home in the country or the world. That's a whole different ballgame. And I think energy management is sort of the next thing to go on top of that platform beyond security. And then there's other things beyond that, which is healthcare. You know, this audience doesn't care too much about that, from, maybe from a personal standpoint, you do. But healthcare, and elder monitoring, and, and all the things, you know, you walk on a scale and, and you measure your, your blood pressure and blood oximeter and, and pulse and everything gets reported. And did the grandma take her pills in the morning, or did she wake up and how active she was? Those kinds of things are very valuable. They're just not done in a mass scale. They're done in very science uh, project basis, you know, islands of functionality here and there. But if you can tie all that together, I think uh, there's huge things that are going to happen. Uh, there's a whole discussion on industrial So that's that's good. that's good. So Aaron, keep this keep this going for us. Yes, uh, we want to know from your perspective what's hot and and what's not because. Show me a trend that's major and cross-cutting as IoT, and 
I'll show you overhyped elements of that trip. So, so where do you, where do you sit? And, I mean, there's a lot of things. So to echo what the resident said, I think security is a big piece to it. And, and you referenced it indirectly, Dave, you mentioned it also in your intro. Is I think so much of it has to do with crafting behavior. And that's behavior of a consumer, behavior of a business as well. And I think that's where a lot of that value is um, that, that these companies can provide and being able to do that. And uh, when we look to do it, in particular, what's hot for us is doing it on a global scale. So it's being able to, uh, we recently launched a technology, it's a global sim, which a lot of stuff that I would talk about is not particularly that sexy, but it's really key and important. So the idea of having a global sim so that a device can be put anywhere in the world or a company can take that same solution, put it anywhere across the globe, and be able to have that access and have it work cohesively together, I think is important. Because one, one of the, the downfalls, one of the potential issues, Dave, you're asking, I, I think is the concept of fragmentation. So if this, you know, even, even to the individual, if you're talking a connected home, a connected car, connected health, all of that can just take you in 20 different directions and all of a sudden all you're doing is just focusing on all these things that are monitoring things instead of having it be cohesive to be able to affect that behavior and give you insights that you need. And I think the same thing can happen with the enterprise. And that's why what, what we look at, the way we look at things is, uh, we don't want to be just the, the dumb pipe, right, just the internet. But we want to find ways to uh, provide value with partners. So, for example, to the, to the enterprise comment, we had a pretty significant deal that we mentioned with uh, that we launched with GE in the industrial internet, and being able to provide their ability to monitor, manage, control their devices remotely across the world. If you look at a, a deal we had with Maersk, for example, where with um, temperature control containers, basically anywhere across the world across multiple types of network, being able to get insight to make sure that they know exactly where that is and that the right temperature control and everything is properly happening within. So for us, it's finding ways to work within an ecosystem to then deliver something that's of value to the customer. My, my take, yes, sir, thank you. From, from an economic model, I mean, let's just start with a real world example in utilities, right? 15, 20 years ago, you'd have to physically go to a house to look at an energy meter and get a reading. Then you go to AMR technology, AMR allows you to drive through a neighborhood with a radio to a truck and, and take that. Now we're in the AMI technology world where you can do it at a much more scale. So if we map the cost to actually even monitor you know, in-home meters, that's gone way down. Let's correlate that then with consumer markets. So I will quote a retailer, I won't tell you which retailer it is. The items in, in automation that are selling first is the camera, the IP camera. So the cameras are first. The second is really the connected lighting, right? Think about the visceral, folks like it. Third is around the thermostat. So we talked a little bit about thermostat and comfort. And third is the door locks. And so what we're seeing is fundamentally, this is a panel on business models. We have been in a two-party economic business model for consumer side, where there is a service provider, quote unquote, that could be ADT or Comcast and AT&T, subsidizing hardware and services to an end user. And the value prop of, you know, I don't want to talk too much about the security model, but it's $1,200 to $1,400 of hardware, and there's an acquisition cost, and you, you recoup it in 36 months. We're moving to a, a much more interesting market that has enterprise effects, very similar to what wireless carriers do with end-to-end, -end, which is there are relationships that can be constructed in the home and in the enterprise that makes sense to have a third party in there. So in the case of a home, the insurance company wants to have a way to reduce their exposure for water damage or CO2 damage. They could clearly call up Aaron and partner with AT&T to say, we would love this actuator to be in the home on a water sensor. Mm -hmm. And because we're doing that and using your network, we'll pay you a fair value. And for the consumer, we're willing to, because they have that, reduce their cost. So we're kind of in this normative stage where we really have to spend time on reducing the cost to deploy. If you ask me as like a, a person who's been a veteran of home automation, fundamentally the value prop, the value prop of it has not been exciting enough for the mass market to go and buy it. If they felt like they were going to get the value, they would pick up the phone and order it or go to the store. It just hasn't happened. And so the fundamental thing that I focus now on Greenway, how do we mass deploy it by reducing the cost? Add a couple more people to the mix and do that. Very good. Now I want, to, I want us to put ourselves five to ten years into the future. Uh, a minute ago, 
Nate talked about digital representation and the fact that a very interesting number that I wasn't aware of, 0.6% uh, of electrical devices are currently, currently have a digital representation on the internet. Let's put ourselves forward to a world in which 50 or 75% of all the electrical devices in the world have a digital representation on the internet, and furthermore, there's an abstraction layer so that programmers can easily get a hold of that, uh, of the information, and create entirely unexpected interactions between digital thermometers and home energy monitors and pollen collectors and everything else. Um, so, Aaron, talk to me about some new services that AT&T could potentially overlay across that world, aided by the abstraction layer, aided by the digital representations, that are very different from anything that you offer today, and way beyond the current promise of just straight-up connectivity that at and offers. Sure. So I, I think part of it is taking that connectivity as a layer, but then adding value on top of it in the network. So instead of having another device that needs to be there, being able to take that functionality within, and to your point, allow for platforms so that developers can then take that functionality and integrate it in their solution. So how do you imagine making money in that world? Sure, so I mean, we do a new revenue stream um, for at and not, not to say that we have the right model now, but one thing that we, we have embarked on is having a, an API platform where we expose network functionality. Things as simple as an SMS or a billing uh, functionality, but where it gets exciting is in better location awareness. And I think a lot in security. So it's very exciting when you have a lot of these devices that has a layer for you to be able to develop on, but that, at least the way we think, that is a lot of exposure. And so we think we can provide a lot of value to the individual, but also in particular to the enterprise. But key mission critical things happening amongst these devices to be able to make sure they're separate. Good. Reza, other thoughts on uh, where we might, uh, on uh, a five to ten year perspective on uh, um, energy needs IoT? Where might we go? And uh, where, might, where might we make money? So I think, I think the, I don't think that the challenges are technological challenges. I think the challenges are business challenges. So regulatory issues, uh, business model and go-to-market challenges. I'll give you an example. So Mendel, I live in Mendel Park, which is just across the campus on the other side. You know, we just upgraded all of our street lights to LED lights, which is great. Uh, but they're not communicating LED lights. They just come on, when they come on, there's a light sensor, and they go off in the morning when the sun comes out. Uh, there's another flavor of that light that could have been remotely controlled. Right? You could, you could, at the head end, the city didn't want to spend the money for whatever reason. Hopefully they just put it on the park. If they are, actually, I'd like to talk to you about that <laughs> uh, <laughs> afterwards. But uh, there's a way to control those. Right? It would have been, it would have had an extra layer of connectivity and, and control that you don't have today, which would have been really useful. Right? You can even put other sensors in there that measure something beyond light level. Maybe it's sound, right? It's, uh, there's some theft going on, or somebody is getting attacked or mugged, instead of dispatching 911, well, they'll still do that, but you could actually turn on the mic and hear what's going on, for example, or have a camera up there. So I think uh, they didn't do it because I'm guessing there's budgetary reasons, they didn't want to spend that much money, but it's not a technology challenge, right? They could have done that if they, somebody in the city council or a group of them uh, approved it. Uh, that's just one example. I mean, you go and talk to utilities, uh, it's a whole different set of regulatory challenges. And uh, I mean, I was, before founding my control, I was with a company called Echelon for 12 years. And, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we were doing utility trials with them. Uh, then, <laughs> Uh, they're still doing utility trials, and I guarantee they're going to be doing utility trials 20 years from now. Uh, that's just the nature of the business. There's a lot of regulatory stuff. Uh, every region is different. Um, there's just a lot of hurdles. So, so my concern, and I'm fearful as a consumer, as a, as a citizen, is that that stuff is slowed down. But I'm, I'm a startup guy. I have short attention span. I have virtual ADD and. OCD, I think we're talking to one of my friends before this, right? It's like, I want to get this stuff done, I want to get shit happen, but it just doesn't. It's like molasses when it gets to regulatory stuff and, and uh, uh, budgetary stuff and go-to-market stuff. So regulatory issues aside, let's drill into your point a little bit, because mm -hmm. I think it's a very interesting one. If I understand correctly, you're suggesting that because of the relatively intimate place they occupy in people's homes, um, Energy companies could provide services way beyond bringing energy to your home, enabled by emerging IoT technology. 
such as security services or other logistic services. Is that their business? Is that appropriate? Is that an appropriate, uh, uh, you know, adjacent or uh, adjacency or extension of current utility business? Or should we be looking at other businesses entirely to leverage off um, IP networks to provide uh, uh, security, logistics, home delivery, um, whatever? Sure. Yeah. Because it was a, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, sure. it's, a, it's an interesting point to, yeah. to propose that level of expansion right, of right, right, right. utilities company. No, that's a great unit. So no, it's not the utilities business today. Yeah. But so what? Right. I mean, yeah. cable TV companies that were not in the business of offering internet connectivity, but they did. And they were hugely successful at it. And then after that, they said, well, "What's the next thing we can offer?" Well, it's phone. They weren't in the phone business, but they decided to compete with phone companies and they did a bang up job. They bought it. Yeah. And now they're saying, all right, what's the fourth thing we can do? The quad flip, right? No, well, security. So they're not as, nobody thinks of a Comcast as a security company. Does it, but does it mean it's a bad thing? No. Um, you can still go to ADP or whoever wants to get it. But uh, I think it's kudos to all the telcos and cable companies for thinking out of the box and really pushing the envelope and doing this. And that's what utilities aren't doing and haven't done, right? It can't just be about reading the meter. God, please. I mean, that, there's so much more you can do because you've got to pipe into the home. And they've talked about and done trials about getting into the home and doing demand side management and controlling your AC with your permission or maybe changing your thermostat settings by a couple of degrees with your permission and you get some credit for it or whatever. It just hasn't happened yet. Part of it, again, is because the economics don't make sense and nobody really cares. I, you know, I want the house to be 71. I don't care what you do. Keep it at 71. Some people are like that. Uh, but surely there's got to be a way to figure out. Surely they can get into the home and do some things that are beyond just pure energy. They touch energy, but they also offer a more compelling value proposition for the homeowner. Maybe it's security, maybe it's lighting, maybe it's automation, maybe it's good. thermostat control. I mean, why couldn't this be done by a utility? Well, I mean, so, Thomas, from the other panelists yeah. on IoT enabled adjacencies uh, and opportunities for utilities? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is the, the U.S. trends are not indicative of what we're seeing around the world. So uh, GreenWave is a partner with Eon Energy. We're rolled out in three countries right now. They're the largest utility in Europe, they have 32 million customers. We work with Ford on energy there, we work with Dong. So I, I think the category of how we have to look at this is, is service providers in a, in a broad bucket. Here in the US, uh, you know, wireless carriers, broadband service providers have been the market makers mm -hmm. to really provide the value. In cases where there's deregulation, like in parts of Europe, what we're really seeing is they have a customer relationship they want to innovate. They have an economic reason too. Right, it's not a capital business. We're putting capital work and building more. But, you know, sort of build the grid out it doesn't it doesn't help them and their shareholders. And so I think I do agree with Reza that getting the recipe right is really the issue. I want to uh, bridge to a point that was in the investment uh, session earlier today that Pedro ran, which is we're talking about five years out or ten years out, and there was actually a very uh, set of good comments from Dave from Kleiner Perkins and others is what went wrong with clean tech investing. Why did people go so deep on clean tech that turned into some investments that didn't come in? And why was there an apathy in 2010, 2011? And so for me, as an entrepreneur and an executive, I think a lot about how do we take this excitement for IoT and really turn it into some sustainable companies and business practices. And so instead of maybe some of the top spin that you see at a lot of these companies, let me talk about two issues that I think we need to fundamentally work on. So I think first is we need a more healthy and open discussion around security of the data. So when we think of Internet of Things and we think about devices, whether it's in the utility side, where obviously if you start me uh, messing with grid management and certain access points, there's an issue, or even in a consumer's household, right? We have to walk that slowly, that progression to say, if you're willing to exchange a piece of data that has value, you could get a subsidy for a service. So for example, I don't pay for all the content that I watch, it's ad supported, right? I'll pay for Game of Thrones because I love this stuff, but there's certain things I don't. I don't pay to watch NFL football, it's on there. So I think we have to have that healthy discussion. I think the second is the role of standards was brought up earlier. If we don't make the right choices in the next 12 to 24 months on standards, we're going to see this uh, hype of the market start to fade. And the standard norming is a, a variety of larger players and startups trying to get a disproportionate share of 
of the market, right? We're seeing the biggest players out there try and get their share. And so what we really need is a healthy discussion about what's the best way to get a device on the network. So when Reza was at Echelon, they actually had a great technology called ISI that worked really well and Wand works. There are ways to do this, and so we don't want consumers, or we don't even want utilities. When I talk to utility, I want to have the discussion, oh, Zigbee, Smart Energy Profile, or Lightlink. It's about, I want to offer this to the consumer. I want to make this relationship happen. Last thing I would say, just stream of consciousness here is, we do a terrible job of providing the customer service representatives at the enterprise with the data they need to do their job well. And that's an area where we can definitely improve. So think about it. I now tell you, you're, you're a CSR at at and You have a U-verse TV package. You have broadband service. You have cell phone service. You have the Zanbu digital life service. That guy gets a car, or gal gets a call. How do you deal with the data? And so one of the things that I'm excited about is starting to better represent and visualize that data so the folks can make better decisions. So in the case of at and your service gets more expensive if they have to roll a lot of trucks and pick up the phone. Are there things we can do in the network to help you out so it says, hey, that device, because sometimes there could be a bad device, a camera, a sensor, can we shut that down so people can see their game of thrones on a tablet, hopefully. Jeez. There was a lot, a lot of things mentioned, so. Uh, <laughs> to address a few. I, I think at this point, yes, they, I think the cable companies and telcos have done a good job of, of jumping into that market. I, I feel like at this point, for utilities, the only real play they have is just cost controls and efficiency, really. It's not, I don't think it's really anything that can be offered additive value to the customer. And part of the reason is because, I, you reference our digital life product, we call it digital life because it's starting in the home, but it goes everywhere, it's mobile. And so when you look at utilities, they have that home, but increasingly it's not about just the home, it's about anywhere we are, everywhere we are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, security is, is a huge, huge piece to it that, that we look at, uh, partially because we're delivering it, um, but we, we tend to take, uh, as, a, as a telco, uh, a different approach to security and privacy. Instead of looking to monetize it as much as others, we. Uh, see the value, you know, NSA, things exciting. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, but the, um, what was the last point you made? The, you said that? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and then in, in terms of, uh, you know, the standards obviously is a important piece as well. Yeah, um, yeah no, you were talking about, sorry, you were talking about customer service. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, anyway, but, but, but Because there's, so yeah. there, the example that came out recently. Why did you look at the at and though, when you talk about customer service? <laughs> yeah. I know why. This, the, the, the recent phenomenon that people talked about was actually like Nike <laughs> and said, you don't want to make the hardware and the software service anymore because it's too difficult to support 200 versions of Android. And so, I think the service provider discussion that we've been privy to, again, I can't go into the customer details, we do work with Verizon, DirecTV, and others, is somebody's going to get a call, and these devices all have device states, so there is this idea of, you know, running this information and managing these devices is very difficult work, and so managing just a broadband router is hard. So with all these devices on a home or in a network, how do you make sense of those? And then again, data, there's this idea of unstructured data. It's all about information, right? Information and forms. Data is just ones and zeros. So we have to do a better job. Good. I have yeah, a, I have more questions. Go ahead. And, 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 yeah, I want to say I think I think there is there is a play within within customer service, and it's really about you know anticipating and taking care of things instead of the customer yeah. needing to to drive that particular. Mm -hmm. sure. I have plenty more questions for the three of you, but I would love to hear from the audience if any questions have come up uh, in, in, what, uh, in what you've heard. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, the, we'll bring the mic to you. Uh, so wait till you get that. Hi, my name's Mark. Um, I guess I have a question for Nate. Is, do, do you see any merit in a, a counter argument that the risks of devices being connected are starting to uh, outweigh the benefits? In things like, um, you know, nations starting to attack other nations' networks, um, to take down power grids, to control vehicles, to turn on microphones and cameras in people's private lives, and, and those kinds of things. Like, I'm not talking about as much the reality of the risk as the perception of the risk. 
I no, I, I think as part of the scenario planning, you have to look at those cases, and you have to assume that devices that have connectivity, there are folks that want to go after them. So I, I agree with you. I think those are that was part of my comment on security, which is really you expand the amount of data that's out there, but you also expand the responsibilities of the parties that are privy to that data. Mm -hmm. And so how do you take advantage of you know the security method? Fundamentally, we have a, a product that's at Home Depot right now for connected lighting. Um, there's a trade-off in the design process. I mean, I do an expert at this. It's between usability and security, right? Mm -hmm. So we could run a UI that says, did you absolutely put a wet key on that router? And, and some folks like that. Other folks, what you find, they just don't end up completing it. And so I think the key is, is about information. So what we've seen with cookies and other parts, people need to know what's at stake and they need to make smart decisions about what they're comfortable with. Shocking thing for me, being a Gen Xer and working with a lot of millennials, is just fundamentally, every time I make an assumption about how people, especially millennials, are gonna to act to an issue, it's always wrong. <laughs> like, I say, they need this, they need that, and then I'll have somebody on my team who's a millennial and say, absolutely, no yeah. concern. Yeah. So, I think, again, policy, planning, the one thing I don't wanna do in Petrum's, uh, you know, panel. They mentioned regulatory. I counted it. It's 34 times. Huh. I definitely don't want to have a discussion where we drop regulatory that much. It's just mm -hmm. we have to be able to self-manage. And I think actually telcos and service providers do a great job of that. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I add something to that also? Just mm -hmm. my personal mm -hmm. opinion on security. There's a lot of there's a lot of coverage on privacy and security and NSA and all that stuff when it comes to IoT. Uh, and I could tell you. Uh, from personal experience, the level of encryption and authentication that we've put in our stuff in the past is at least an order of magnitude better than online banking, right? Mm -hmm. and if you remember online banking when it came around about 10, 12 years ago, people were like, oh my God, you know, they're going to go online and steal my cash, right? And now, I, I mean, I'm, I'm cashing checks, taking a picture of it, uh, on my Bank of America. Chase, <laughs> 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 it's, it's, you don't even think of it anymore, right? It's just, it's a, it's a, so my, this is my personal opinion, maybe it's controversial, but I think 10 years, 20 years from now, I'm gonna look back and say, what the hell are we thinking about, right? It's like the argument of, oh my God, you know, uh, the, the, the VCR is gonna kill the movie theater experience. Well, it's not, it's just another, uh, it's just, you get my opinion. Uh, I think it's, it's overblown. There is concern that we gotta make sure it's locked down and it's tight. But once you do that, I think it becomes much more of a, uh, psychological argument than anything else, especially with, as, as, you, as Nate said, I think the younger generation, they're like, whatever. You know, they, they, want, they download an app and they ask you for your name and email and phone number, stuff you would never give out 10 years ago. And you don't even think about it anymore. You know, boom, it's done. And uh, so that's, that's just, again, that's become the, the norm, the habit, uh, the user experience expectations that we talk about. I'd like, I'd like to discuss that. Uh, uh, First a success story, uh, and then a horror story, and see how, how you feel about it. My name is Sam. Uh, I, I teach at Stanford. Uh, and, and, uh, so um, the, the success story is how many people know about the potholes of Boston? Boston? Oh, the potholes of Boston. So the deal was it cost a million dollars or whatever to drive around and find out where the potholes are. Oh, well, let's give everyone uh, a little phone app and an accelerometer, and now we know where the potholes are in two minutes. <laughs> I like that. And that's really clean. And you didn't have to put sensors in the cars because they had the sensors in the cell phone. So that's such a first line of defense. It's a cell phone, you get all sorts of stuff on. And here's a horror story. And I don't know why this hasn't happened yet, and maybe it has. If, if I wanted to commit a gangland murder today, I'd buy a drone. I don't hear the FAA talking about, oh, they're worried about these things flying into jet air intakes or something. Forget that. Yeah. Think about gangland workers <coughs> with drones. And you got, I don't know, the line of missiles that pop up on their shoulders or something? I, I don't know. I, I'm just, just tossing it out there for you guys to run with. But you have another horror story. So this isn't, isn't just like lack of security, it's actually being a service act that you carry out. <laughs> We'll keep you guys up in terms of <laughs> Well, drones now. We're driving, we're driving. I'm totally going to, I'm really looking up on the way back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Any, any, I, I'm, um, you know, we talked on the, uh, on the uh, demand side of energy, we talked about the concern, you know, the fact that many of the, uh, the digital millennials have a little less concern about giving away personal information, but how about, how about the supply side? Do you have concerns about, uh, uh, IoT enabled breaches into, um, you know, into power generation stations, that could be a huge risk for national security. What are, what, how can we mitigate that? And how much, how big a concern is that of yours as, as insiders in energy? Uh, I agree with Reza's comment. I mean, when we look at like authentication, I don't want to get too deep into a discussion of security, but we look at like authentication of the data, we look at conditional access servers or key servers or PKI centers, there are folks asking the right questions of how to lock it down. There's a such thing as you know, great power, great responsibility. There always needs to be somebody in every organization that spends time making sure that things are locked down. There's somebody within at and a whole team, there's other service providers. So you know, I think the key is, is never assuming, never make an assumption about a case, a use case, where there's not a, a null case, right? So if you have an access to a door lock, right, then you have to assume there could be a use case that somebody says, hey, I want to mimic that person, and I want to get in the house through the door lock. And so the good part is, I think Reza mentioned, there is a, a, a amount of pressure reporting because we want to do something to sort of deflate this Internet of Things phenomenon. And so I, I just can tell you as somebody who's running a company that's got 200 people, we spend a ton of time uh, thinking about security. Our customers spend a ton of time making sure we have conformance to security. And again, I hope that it's at least part of the conversation, right? I hope that we continue to move that forward. And I think the key is I've been privy to some really excellent thinkers and minds on the subject. So it's, it's something you're not going to solve. Good. You just have to keep working. Good. Good. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, on, on the enterprise side for ATT, I mean, that's the, our whole foundation is around private networks, which is offering that security and reliability and other things that are needed, even in the you know, internet of things, even if it's a low bandwidth sensor somewhere. And so while I think there's a lot of importance around the idea of authentication and, and that software side on the access, I think there's certain value, and I don't necessarily think we have an answer, but I think that the service provider has an opportunity to be able to offer something that offers that security. So it's not just, here's, here's the software that you have to go through at the endpoint, which is more vulnerable than a clear path that really can't be penetrated through the whole transaction. So, good. President. Uh, just another high level comment, which is we're never, I mean, there's always going to be a race between the bad guys and the good guys, right? You're always going to, and you know, you have to continue to keep ahead of crime and the bad guys. That's never going to end. Uh, so the question is, do you stop progress and do you stop innovation because you're worried about this stuff? And my personal answer is no. And I hope most of you guys would say the same thing. You, you just can't. Uh, uh, so progress has got to happen. It's, actually, it's unstoppable, frankly, to be honest with you. You can't stop this, this happening. So you just got to be diligent and uh, make sure you do the best you can to the uh, people in charge of uh, putting equipment and, and security guards, even physical the security guards, you know, for that. So, that's good. I've already got my little anti aircraft missiles. <laughs> 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 good. Shoulder to air. Yeah. Uh, my blood pressure just drops. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to give the audience a little bit. Yeah. Oh, did I need the mic? Yeah, shoot it. Hold up. That was the first I had heard of that use case of a drone. I had heard somebody talk about delivering a beer by a drone or watching your children from a drone. I never heard of it. I think I thought it up, but luckily it was gone. I don't I want to kill so. <laughs> But then you did. So um, I would love to hear your out of box thinking on how companies like yours could use and utilize um, customer energy data. Um, so once customers, when customers release that data to you with their given, you know, permission, um, what could you do with it? Beyond the obvious. <laughs> I, I can just speak from, from personal experience. What, what excites me about what's happening at the intersection of the sensors and the energy use is when you start thinking about renewables and other, you know, uh, energy that gets generated inside of the household and that, how that affects the grid, 
I think that's really exciting how people can take personal accountability for how much they're using and where they're generating. I think over time, because what we're seeing on the data sets, the data is so large that you can start to see patterns. And so what hasn't always been a, a very bright part of the data science has been the predictive analytics of what happens with load shaping and load shifting. And so again, I think there are things that happen outside of knowing who you are and where you live or resident Menlo Park that sort of say, these are consumption activities that are normally correlated. So World Cup soccer, there's going to be a lot of us in front of TVs. The TVs that you know, create the need for more power. You know, causality like that. Um, the type of products that I focus on is really to what Aaron had mentioned, which is we fundamentally feel like we can reduce the cost to deploy these services as Greenway, when we spend a lot of time with our service provider partners focusing on how that call never happens because you sort of understand what how the two get correlated, you know, how does a connected light bulb and a, and a security system work together, and that's that's one of the things that I found really exciting. Good. Other, other correlations? Other thoughts about uh, unexpected connections or correlations, um, particularly when you throw big data analytics into the mix and you're able to combine Usage on the consumer side with other unpredictable events, political, meteorological, crime stats, or anything. What and do we do with that information? That's, that's, that's the way that frame of reference is how AT&T thinks all the time. Like we yeah. uh, we do little tests here and there, but I mean, it has to do with network connectivity, right? Yeah. But like at the Super Bowl, we basically just said we're going to give as much bandwidth as we can in when it was at Cowboy Stadium, and we're going to see what happens. And then we watch these trends of how. You know, uploading versus downloading and, and different things throughout the game and when something happens in the game, how that affects. And I think all of that would allow us, and that might cause them to be able to turn that on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, and, and to, to the point of just delivery of, of electricity and, and power, such as th there's a lot of ways to make that more dynamic. So, it's not just here's the stream of it at all times, it's you know, when can you let that off? When, when is there enough already stored in that location? Or even if one location happens to be more of a producer than a consumer, and how that can be shared amongst the, the group given, you know, finding ways to have them all network together. That's what I think is particularly exciting. But uh, the, I think what's, what's important in that, and the way we typically look at things, is it's two-sided. So it's not only an experience for the customer, but it's also the value for the company that is delivering it. And so it's, it's always a, a two-way thing. I think it's important to keep that in mind. So great customer experience, the comfort, the lower, the lower cost, the ease of it, but then also the value from an expense perspective and a monetization perspective to the enterprise. I think part of what makes the answer to your question exciting is that we don't know yet, but we know that we have the tools to find some, to find some really unexpected and exciting discoveries. <coughs> My data scientist friends often like to say, data loves to touch other data. Yeah. And it's very exciting. <laughs> it, it, it's very exciting to me that big data analytics has progressed to the point where Beyond just looking at a single massive database to check a given hypothesis, a data scientist can now look for entirely unexpected correlations, and in some cases infer causality between amazingly different data sets. You know, such as such as um, aerial photographs versus you know energy usage, or crime stats versus energy usage, or, 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 or something like that. So I think that I think <clears throat> if anything, the fact that we don't know what types of interesting uses there are for the data suggests that we're in for a really fun ride once we have better access to it. Yeah, Dave, Dave, Dave one, one other thing I think is particularly interesting is in terms of how it's still to be determined is where that pivot point is going to be. I mean, it, and I think different parties are, are playing. Right? Is it going to be a, uh, a utility provider? Is it going to be a network provider? Is it going to be an operating system on a mobile phone? So I think that'll be interesting because to the point I made before about fragmentation, I, I don't think we'll be able to handle just, if you look at estimates of the Ericsson's of the world where they're saying 20 billion connected devices, I don't think that unless we have a strong pivot point that it's going to be as valuable as it could be. And I don't think, I, I know myself, I'm not ready to manage 20 platforms at once. Uh, and so. Um, just one data point to that. Um, uh, Mike Pfeffer with uh, Ibis Networks. So we do a plug load management for large enterprises. So we make dumb devices smart with, a, with an IntelliSocket that we put in. One of the things that we're seeing as a value add for our customers is device health. That when you start to look at the energy signature of thousands of similar devices, the example I would use is the little brown refrigerator in your hotel. They're all the same model. 
you can start to look at whether it's operating in a healthy fashion or it's having a heart attack because the compressor's failing or it's iced up or something like that. So predictive maintenance has jumped up to be a big selling point for our product. Yep. It wasn't where we started with just turning things off and energy efficiency. So we're, we're seeing all kinds of cool, yep. crazy stuff with the data. Yep. Uh, am I correct in assuming that, that, that the indications, the advanced indications of those predictive uh, of predictive maintenance are probably not data trends that human brains could easily have spotted. Am I, am yeah, I, am you, you, I correct you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see that, and you don't see yeah. it until you are able to look at enough of them. Yeah, and, and over enough time, time and really start, really start to look at that predictive yeah. maintenance aspect and device health. Yeah. So that's kind of a cool thing that we've seen. But uh, the question to the panel, um, you know, with our socket technology, you know, even with a, a hundred nodes in an office environment, uh, you're creating a proverbial S load of, of data yeah. all the time. It is massive, um, and the the bandwidth constraints get pretty significant. So the, the question would be, um, we don't touch residential, so it's kind of the area, I guess. Is is when you've got 20, 30, 40 of these devices uh, trying to talk on your Wi-Fi network, how quickly does <laughs> does it get swamped? And, and what do you see? Where do you guys see that kind of uh, the, the the communications infrastructure going? I think it's a great question. I mean, I can speak from, from what we provide. So, so when we look at network topology, and, and my team, our ex-Cisco, ex-Motorola folks worked on the TR69 standard, so there are certain workloads that are done over a Wi-Fi network, right? And then you have quality service for those, and then these connected home devices are either Zigbee or Z-Wave or Inskion or Echelon. And so we are spending time right now looking at those intersections. And then what you end up doing, some of the service providers are thinking about how do we have dynamic quality of service that sort of says, these are the use cases, and I don't want to presuppose for at and but I'm a service provider. I want my video experience to be flawless, especially right. big game, big show. I want voice quality to be flawless. If some actuator that's sending a signal to like a garage door opener has some latency, I'm cool with that. Right. But where we've we've pushed, and again, don't want to go too deep into what I do specifically at Greenway, is we've looked at ways to basically oscillate between the Wi-Fi network and, and LTE and other backhaul. Mm -hmm. So for the cases the network gets too crazy, throw something off a different network, or again, that's the good part about this is some of these connected devices actually don't take up much data, and they don't push out data too much. One of the problems, prior Reza, that you saw and I saw in the early 2000s with home automation is like they were always sending data and always pulling. But the status of networks have really changed in the last 10 years. The network 10 years ago was all about data coming in. It was all about, especially in residential, everything was coming in. All, all the feeds, all the information. Now, 10x more is going out. Mm -hmm. So the upstream is really being pushed because drop cams are taking video recordings, and Nest thermostats are throwing stuff around. You got five or six tablets that are posting videos and stuff to buy. And so I love I love where you're heading. Actually, I spent some time in that sector. I think it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. And again, that idea is is paramount to how I look at the market, which is there's only a finite amount of time that we have as either consumers or in our professional life. And we have to have the bigger order decisions sort of teed up. And so things like, is my refrigerator, you know, gonna go on the fritz, that makes no sense. But to the refrigerator or warranty folks, that's huge. Yeah. And so anything you can do to say, hey, Aaron, I'm gonna call AT&T because now it's like something doesn't work. They may say, we see five tablets and we're gonna give you more bandwidth right now for an hour. And I, I completely agree to that, and, and I, I think that yeah, for us it is is offering that dynamic environment so that the platforms on top of it they are allowed to do that. So I, I think from from the device's perspective, from the user's perspective, I don't think they really care. And I don't think any of us really care whether it's on mobile or Wi-Fi or anything, right? And so it's just about delivery, and so that that's something that we we need to master. And, and I think that we, we understand just in the normal traffic we have and everything from macro cells to small cells to how that we use Wi-Fi offload just for our cell phones right now. Yeah. And so I think it, it's something that's a real important thing just to offer that reliable, constant connectivity so that the two-way communication can happen. Uh, in, in terms of data security uh, in this area, which crosses so many industries, 
who should drive the solutions there? Should it be government? Should it be industry? Should it be consumers? And this is one of the issues that Nate mentioned as being like a near-term issue. So I'm curious well, what you guys think needs to happen in the near-term on that, and who should be driving? I, well, I think I think to, to your point around millennials, right? Uh, millennials, it's, I don't think it's the customer because they're not going to care about it until something bad happens. So I, I think I think there is a certain role of regulatory. I think there's a certain role of the, the companies that are delivering. Um, the AT and T's of the world, we tend to be mindful of it. We come from a regulatory background, so um, I think that's key. And, and then, I mean, for us, that's also a way to monetize, right? We can offer that value in the security. And I think that. It makes a lot more sense, at least right now, on the enterprise side of things. If we find a way to scale that down, it becomes more valuable with the proliferation of consumer devices to, to have something that offers that security, either as an extra additive service or something that's just inherent in the group. Good. Good. We have time for one more question, and then am I correct that all of you can agree we can stay around for a little bit after? Yeah. So if we don't if we if we don't get to your question, go ahead, please. Um, so this is just question regarding net neutrality, and this discussion will, you know, surely continue going forward with the advancement of Internet of Things. How do you see this discussion going forward uh, in a way that uh, benefits consumers? So, net neutrality? Oh, yeah. So, I think that, from a, again, from an enterprise perspective, it's very different enterprise to consumer, right? Because in, in, a, in a dedicated network that a provider provides, we are able to do that quality of service and say, this service is mission critical, this information is needed, so therefore we will give a priority. Um, I, I think it becomes a very different thing in, in consumer. And so I, I think from, from our perspective, you know, we, we have different thoughts on what we, we want to do, what we can do. I, I think it's better for us to focus on the security side of it as opposed to deciding priority and things like that. I, I, I think just, just thinking of where it could be, it could be great if that was something that the consumer was given power to do. You can decide what the priority is, what's important to you, where you want to add that extra security, because this is important to you. Maybe of the generation where it's not as important to you, so who cares, you're not going to need that. But maybe putting some of that power in the consumer's hands, but doing so in a way that it's not overwhelming, right? It's, it's a simple, you get the decision, you get the simplicity. Great. Can we get a hand for the panelists?